Welcome to this week's Long Final Interview. Well, this week, we're talking with author and pilot Michael Trainer. Michael is the author of two large hardback volumes, totaling around 600 pages, including almost 800 images, called Petticoat Pilots, from 1909 to 1939. Michael tells the story of 12 trailblazing women. He spent eight years researching the lives of these women. With an introduction by no less than the President, Michael D. Higgins, it's a remarkable piece of work. Michael joined me on the line from his home, and before we talked about his latest book, I was curious about his own flying history. Um, it started in Limerick, uh, out of the great legendary Kuna. Had a great time there. We moved to Limerick in 1987, and I joined the Dublin Airport Flying Club at the, the old Iona ramp there. And I've been part of that club ever since. Just purely leisure and pleasure flying, strictly. Never went to commercial route or anything like that. What was the day that you decided you were going to give it a go? I, I worked in the bank back in those days in Limerick and it was a customer of ours that came in to us one day and uh, Dr. Ali Khan was his name. He was the chairman of the Limerick Flying Club at the time and the conversation just came up and I said, look, at I'll go out. Got a hooked and addicted. And that was it. Ever since, over 40 years ago. So 40 great years of leisure and pleasure flying, I must admit. Do you remember the first aircraft you flew? It was uh, a Rally 100 Alpha Uniform Papa. Yeah, that's what it cut my teeth on. That's what they had back in those days. Two of them, Alpha Uniform Juliet, Alpha Uniform Papa. Kuna would have been a bit of a, a, of a challenge as well for a new pilot. That's a very good word. Yes, I, I recall the, um, the flight test. Uh, it was with Captain Bob Reedy back in the day. And uh, the flight test lasted all of 15 minutes. I think a lot of examiners would probably cringe at that, but his attitude was, after two circuits at Kuna, and Kuna then in those days, Michael, was uh, considerably shorter and narrower than it is today. And his attitude was that if you, uh, if you can land and take off the way you did at Kuna a couple of times, then you must be good enough for a license. The 15-minute flight test was, 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 was successful, we'll say. So, uh, yeah, it was challenging. Bring me forward a little bit of, in time then to, to the extent where you found yourself in Dublin and, and the Dublin Airport Flying Club. That was, again, was challenging because we had very little air traffic control or anything like that. And we certainly had many line traffic, busy traffic in Kuna. So moving to Dublin Airport from probably one of the smallest airfields in the country to the, to the biggest was uh, definitely a challenge. I progressed there, uh, got checked out in Office M Cessnas is what they operate. And uh, uh, Alpha Whiskey Echo was, was one of them. We just went on, enjoyed it, started doing foreign trips and stuff like that. So. You mentioned foreign trips, uh, and yeah. I, I don't want you to gloss over those because when, when you read about some of the destinations you took those Cessnas to, uh, they might make a, an average PPL extremely envious. I uh, suppose that's what you would call using the privileges of your license to the, to the extent that you could. Um, I never progressed beyond being a VFR PPL. And um, we started going to continental trips and they just got further and further. And uh, I suppose a few of the, the good ones were uh, with our, what was then our CFI, Robin Mandel. And uh, one of our other, uh, Alan Duffy was one of our other club members. We did a, a nice circumnavigation of the, uh, of the Mediterranean involving, uh, I think it was 14 countries. Uh, in, in about five or six days. So it was a pleasant one. That was a good one. Did that go off smoothly? Uh, no. <laughs> despite despite all the planning, we, we invariably didn't even end up in the country we were supposed to be in, never mind the airport. Uh, weather determined a lot of it, and we had a number of diversions for various reasons. But uh, we, we succeeded in getting to, uh, I think Greece was the furthest, Morocco in, in North Africa was... Uh, for the south so uh yeah we, we that was a good trip uh i did another one the son of mine dara he's he's also a ppl and uh one of the other trips we did was across the alps we went to austria and crossed over the alps into italy and back into uh, switzerland and home another flight that you were particularly associated with which was the last general aviation flight out of dublin airport Yes, 18th of October 2008, we had been, I, I suppose, under pressure to get out of Dublin Airport because it was getting congested and there was various 
reasons that just GA wasn't suitable there at the time, particularly after the demise of Iona. Echoing the engine of Amber Golf, uh, with the wind 240 degrees at 12 knots, and you're due for takeoff only 28. So we should left one out, uh, direct to less than the 1500 feet. Yeah, that that last flight was uh, was uh, memorable. We'll say, uh, yeah. Who was on board? I had no hesitation in, in bringing Piers Cahill, who was the the man who brought GA to uh, Dublin Airport fifty years previously. Coleman Corcoran was the other person. Coleman had been a great help to us when we were, I suppose, during our final days there when he was uh, uh, on on the board or. He was certainly on the, at the meetings with the Orient, as it was, or on, on the Dublin Air DA at the time. And the final guy I picked was Aidan Barker. Aidan was the last guy to get a PPL at Dublin Airport. And I, I suppose I picked him because he represented, if anything, the hundreds of other guys that had got PPLs at Dublin Airport. So he was, he was the last and he was, I suppose, one of the choices that I had to make. Know, who who would occupy the fourth seat? So uh, yeah, we had a we had a wonderful send off. Eddie Goggins facilitated with a, a little maneuver down the runway. And uh, the Dublin Airport Fire Brigade, uh, they, they offered two tenders to do a water arch. The rescue helicopter did a nice hover taxi down the runway for us as well. So we went off in style. Are you still flying? Yes. Yeah, I still have a current license. The last trip I did really was the one last year with, again, was Dara, my son, which was, uh, I asked him, would he do me a, a favour and an honour of going to an area I hadn't been to, which was um, Norway, Sweden, Finland, up above the Arctic Circle to Lapland. And, and the two of us set off on our on our little aircraft. And uh, yeah, we did, uh, we did about 30 hours, and uh, 11 of which were over water, being the North Sea, a couple of crossings, and the Baltic Sea, and the Irish Sea. Yeah, it was pretty okay. It was good. It was very good. What was the crew resource management like between father and son? Uh, we're still talking. We're still good. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Dara's a great guy. He's good. He's good. Well, Michael, you have also been extremely busy from the point of view of the books that you've brought out, and uh, and, and I want to mention a couple of them uh, today. But let, let's go back to the first one, which is "Through the Clouds Over Limerick and Beyond," nineteen ninety seven. Uh, what was the what was the the thinking behind that book? Uh, we were coming up to the fiftieth anniversary of uh, of the Limerick Flying Club, which was founded in nineteen forty seven. And uh, the CFI down there at the time, Tony Doyle, asked me if I would put together something about the, the story of Limerick, Fly- not alone just the flying club, but uh, aviation in the Limerick area at, at the time as well, because it goes back to the days of ballooning. Uh, one of the early balloons, balloon flights in Ireland was 1784, which would, uh, took place in Limerick as well. So we covered all of that area as well. Nice to get about, but it it was a real amateur production. But still, it was a it was a start in it. Well, I'm I suppose I, I'm smiling because you know there a lot of people would think about doing something like that, but you actually went ahead and did it. And and I'm wondering what that took. I tell you how it actually started as well was there were some legendary characters down there in Coon, and they used to be talking about the old days. And then I just realised, God, you know, lads, you know, it, it'd be nice to document this and to record it, and I. And I did several tape recordings of some of the older characters associated with, with aviation and Limerick. And it's, it's good to have them on, on record. And then I suppose put the whole thing together and just hit the typewriter and keep going. That was it, yeah. And then you turned your attention to the, to the history of Iona. And there'll be people listening to us in this chat who may have even gone through there, through the Irish Aero Club. When I retired, Michael, in uh, 2000, and, and one of the things, Ronan Lee called around to our house one day, People will know Ronan as, as a film cameraman, I think. Yeah. Correct. Yes, an RTE cameraman at the time. And uh, our discussions came around to talking about the grandfathers of aviation, namely Pierce. And his story hadn't really been told. And, and uh, I got a real terrific response from Pierce. And he literally opened his records to me and gave me 
every every form of uh, assistance, photographs and memorabilia of the years of Iona, which started back in the 1950s and until their demise in 1994. I imagine there might have been some stories from Pierce that didn't make the book. You are dead right. And not alone from Pierce, but from some of the other characters that, that were there as well. When I would be interviewing them and you'd be told, now look, you can't print this or I'm going to lose my license or something like that. So there's a lot of, a lot of the stories I'm afraid have to stay on bar stools. They, they, they didn't make the book. No, they didn't. And that leads us to the chat we're having now, because I have in front of me here two amazing volumes with the title Petticoat Pilots. And I I suppose I'm obliged uh, to to find out the story of it and also the story of the title, because, Michael, we live in very politically correct times and the title might raise an eyebrow or two. Can you put that in context very quickly for us so we're safe? Yeah, uh, how the title came about was there was an air race. It was the first all women's air race in America in the 1920s the journalists of the day dubbed it the powder puff derby and they christened the ladies the petticoat pilots and it was another book written about that event so i, I latched onto that name but i did hear yeah, right i i did ask uh several ladies what would they would their noses be out of joint uh with, with such a title but no they thought it was very apt it, it suited the the period of the time being you know a century ago the 1920s or thereabouts and yeah it, it uh it worked. As I said, even though people can't see you and I having a chat at the moment, we can certainly do our best to describe the quality of the production is superb. But it's no accident that what there's almost eight years of research in it, is there? Yes. Three of the ladies, I picked 12 ladies, or I didn't even know some of them when I started the research over, over that eight year period. But three of them had been documented. That's Lady Heath, Lady Bailey and Lillian Bland. So I kind of put them to one side, you know, haven't got the permission of the authors of their books. So the other nine turned out to be uh, quite a bit of a challenge in a way because it was uh, all original research. It was um, going to various libraries. And, and I only started off with a couple of names, but eventually it, it grew. You know, when you'd be researching one story, you'd find out of another lady. And I was very, very fortunate with all 12 families that they facilitated by going to attics and going to various rooms in their houses that hadn't been disturbed for years and years. And they uh, they found, oh, between them all, about 800 photographs nearly of, of the, the, their granny or their great aunt, which had never seen the light of day. So I was, I was really lucky in that regard. So many of the photographs in that are, have never been published before, but they're, they, they tell a story of, I suppose, the achievements of women of... Um, of that generation about 100 years ago, which we kind of started honouring the 1916 and thereabouts ladies. So it, it kind of, it grew from that, that we're, we're honouring the achievements of women of that period. And I decided to do it in a biographical kind of format, treat each chapter uh, separately and give the ancestry of the ladies. And again, all the families were, were wonderfully cooperative given their family history, and uh, bring, it, bring it right up to when the ladies themselves learned to fly and the difficulties they encountered and the challenges and their achievements and uh, bring it as much as possible up to the present day or certainly cover their entire lifestyle with, with each of the 12 ladies throughout chapters. So the books cover a period from 1909 to 1939. Uh, why did you pick that span? This, the first of the ladies started in 1909, um, uh, Violet Dunville. Uh, she was a balloonist and she uh, did air races around Europe in a balloon. And 1939 was the cutoff because I, uh, that was when uh, women went over to uh, England to join the ATA, they might have gone abroad and it would have been difficult. I'll, I'll leave that for another author to cover that period of, of women. So the 20s and 30s was the pioneering age for a lot of these women when they did Extraordinary flights, really, uh, not alone in, in Ireland and England, but um, they, they traveled America, they went to Canada, and uh, two of them did uh, amazing flights. When you consider that the aircraft of the time were open cockpit and very basic instruments, and they flew down to Cape Town in, in South Africa from London, um, 1928 and 29. And uh, their non-existent navigation aids, they were using, they were tearing pages out of atlases nearly as they went along, trying to figure out and follow railway lines, follow rivers. And 
Um, they were they were two of the more notable flights that they did. Oh, you know, it's a piece of social history as well because you're talking about a new country. Uh, we, you know, we were finding our own identity, and also the the impression that people might have, you know, if they're of a certain age, is that you know we didn't hear about women pilots uh, in in Aer Lingus until uh, the late seventies, in fact, here uh, in, in this country. But these were pioneering women in their own right. Were they all ladies, aristocracy? Were they all women of means? Yes, in in eleven of the twelve cases, they. They came from, they were descended from arist- aristocratic backgrounds. Uh, so they either were born that way or they married titled gentlemen with, with plenty of money. So they, it was really only one of them that was the, the rags to riches story, which was a lady from Ackle Island, Nancy Corrigan. And at 16 years of age, she went from poverty stricken Ackle to uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and she worked her way through, through the gentry houses over there. But um, she was a beautiful woman, gorgeous woman, and she eventually ended up as a a model in New York where she was well paid. And uh, she used her earnings from her modeling career to to fund her, well, what turned out to be her secret flying lessons in the beginning. Her parents and her employers didn't know anything about her, uh, her, her secret lessons until they read it on the front page of the paper where she sold it after four and a half hours. Four and a half hours. Yes. Yeah. 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 What were the practicalities of learning to fly then? I mean, where? where what was the licensing process, or, and where did they learn? Well, the, most of the Irish women went to went to London because the London Aeroplane Club was the probably the first proper training ground for a lot of them. Uh, in fact, three of them were there at the one time. Uh, the, what was called the Stag Lane Trio. Stag Lane was in the the part of London where the, where the Aero Club was based. And uh, from 1925 onwards, uh, they, Lady Heath being the first of them to go over there. And that's where most of them actually learned to fly was uh, was in, was at the London Club. So it was nothing in Ireland. The first Irish lady was a lady called Shamrock Trench from Galway. And she learned in Baldonnell in 1931. So that was the first, uh, we'd say, homegrown Irish female pilot. Did any of them qualify to a commercial level? Yes, Lady Heath got a position with KLM after after her marathon trip down to South Africa. Uh, they employed her as a, as a co-pilot, but sadly it didn't last very long because I think KLM were, weren't long in existence at the time. And What year are we talking? 1929. And she, I, I think they developed a fear that if there was an incident with a woman pilot, that their their reputation could be damaged. So that, that's the area you were living in. And that's how difficult it was for women. And that, that's, a, I suppose, a notion that stayed on for another 50 years after that. Yeah. When, you, when you spend that length of time, as you've done, researching these people's lives and, you know, looking at photographs of them, etc., I'm I'm curious to know: Was there any one of the people or, or other that you'd love to have met? Oh wow! I hadn't thought of that one. That's a good question. No, I hadn't thought of that one, Michael. No, I think as I was researching them, I was only doing about two a year, and and each of them fascinated me at the time. So um, no, no, I would like to have met them all. Actually, you know. <laughs> I thought you might say that. Tell me about uh, the Limerick lady, Sophie Pierce. That's Lady Heath. Yeah, she she actually had a very tragic beginning because her her father, when she was only a year old, her father sadly murdered her mother uh, in their family home in Newcastle West. But she was reared by aunts of hers down there. And eventually she was the lady that went to, to London in 1925. She was the first of the Irish ladies to to get her license. She had a she had a good career uh, other than what I was saying about the KLM uh, involvement but she she did a tour of America she was also involved in a very tragic accident in Cleveland where she um she crashed through the roof of the factory and and she was on death's door really uh, so she she kind of recovered from that but um a lot of some say she didn't really you know um, physically and mentally she had a steel plate in her skull as a result of the accident she she came back to Ireland actually, and she ran the the flying school at what was the former Kildonan Airfield in Finglas. Uh, she took over that from uh, Hugh Cattle, Pierce's father, back in the mid nineteen thirties. Uh, so she ran that for a while there. But um... Michael from Limerick to Cork next, and Cecile O'Brien is another one of the women pilots that you featured in in the volumes. Cecile was <clears throat> she was born in London, but her father, one of the O'Briens, Sir Timothy O'Brien at a castle down in Lahore, Lahore Castle, just outside Mallow. 
and uh, she spent most of her upbringing in that area. They eventually moved back to London and uh, she joined the London Aero Club along with Lady Heath and Lady Bailey. And she was a great ambassador for aviation. She encouraged it. She, I, I suppose she had what you would nearly call air displays of the present day were what she was trying to develop to encourage aviation. Uh, she bought a couple of her own aircraft, which she used to involve in, in air races and different flights around the UK. Sadly, in 1931, she was uh, ferrying her newly acquired aircraft back to her base in, in, in London. She was, she was involved in a very serious accident, which cost her her life and uh, the life of her passenger as well. So she became, tragically, the, the first, first, first Irish woman to be killed in, a, in a, an aviation crash. She'd also lost a leg, though, before that. Yes, yeah, she had pre- a previous accident. Uh, you did your research well, yeah? She, uh, she had a, a previous accident where she lost a, a leg and had grave difficulty in getting her license restored. But eventually the authorities granted her license back again. So she was probably the first amputee, certainly female amputee anyway, to, to regain her license and recommence flying again. With your overview of, of this group of women who were involved in aviation, <clears throat> is there a common characteristic? Can we be uh, that general about it that they all seem to share? I, I suppose they had to be gutsy and they had to be pushy in some regards because they were, in a, in a lot of cases, they were they were in a, a male-dominated area at the time, the 1920s and 30s. And uh, I, I suppose they had to be Strong-willed, strong-minded, uh, to persevere with it. Uh, they also, I think, with the exception of Nancy Corrigan, they all came from the gentry background, so they had plenty of leisure time uh, and, and they were well healed. Yeah, they, they, they would have been headstrong, I suppose, in some regard, to persevere with it. Like, certainly Nancy Corrigan had a, a difficult time. What's next for you? Uh, leisure and pleasure. Continue. <laughs> the next book. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know, Michael. I think uh, I was happy with that one. It, it finished off very well and it's been very well received. So I, I'm pleased with that. So I'm not sure what other subjects I can I can broach at this stage. I'm happy enough. The untold stories of aviation, possibly. But there you go. We'll stay on the bar stools. <laughs> Michael, if people want to get their hands on the volumes, where can they get them? I suppose the handiest thing really is I was very fortunate that a friend of mine has created a website, petticoatpilots.com, and you can either buy it there or, yeah, but my email address or phone number is there either way, whichever whichever is convenient. And it is in a number of the bookshops around the countryside as well. And we'll put a link to it as well in the programme notes of this particular podcast as well. Michael Trainer, thank you for joining us on Long Final um, and happy landings. And whatever it is the next book is, I'm sure you'll come back and you'll tell us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you.